Welcome to the Better Business, Better Life show. I'm your podcast host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor. In this podcast, I interview business owners, EOS implementers, and business experts who share with you their experiences, tips, and tools to help you create not only a better business, but also a better life. At the end of each show, you will have three tips or tools that our guests share that you can implement immediately into your life. If you want more information or want to get in contact, you can visit my website, debra.coach. That's D-E-B-R-A dot coach. Please enjoy the show. And I am joined today by Ryan Chatterina, who is not only a professional EOS implementer, but he actually ran EOS in his business for a number of years with an implementer before he became an implementer himself. So I'm really looking forward to hearing his story. Welcome to the show, Ryan. Happy to be here. It is... Uh... 8 40 p.m here on a friday night and we're living the eos life <laughs> <laughs> that's right what else would you rather be doing on a friday evening than talking to somebody on the other side of the world <laughs> uh, let's go cool. hey look i really appreciate you taking the time out from your, your friday evening um so you've got quite an interesting story because as with most eos implementers you have actually had some experience of eos in your business um but you you did actually use an implementer in the business to implement EOS. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey to where you've got to today, you know, what you were doing before you became an EOS implementer, um, and perhaps, you know, the other things you're most proud of. <laughs> yeah, so right off the bat, I'll start, you know, right from my childhood because I, I think it really ties into the overall story. Uh, you know, my dad, mm -hmm. you know, blue-collar family, dad's a truck driver, you know, mom was raising me and my sister, and I just see my dad just, you know, beat himself into the ground, you know, every single week, week in, week out, working 70, 80 hours a week. Uh, and, you know, as a kid growing up, you're like, you know, it's hard to imagine, like, is this really all life is? Like, you're just going to do that until, you know, you retire and then then you can have fun. Like, and so as I grew up, I, I started looking for different alternatives of like, there's got to be a better way. Uh, and, you know, constantly my parents kept talking about, hey, like, you know, there are other alternatives, but they weren't willing to take the risk uh, to really do that. They weren't in a position to be able to do that, but they gave me the opportunity to be able to do that. Um, so, you know, I always went to the best schools. Uh, we didn't have much money, but they were going to put me into the best of the best that I can really surround myself with the best people, uh, people that wanted more out of life. So, you know, that tied right into my career, uh, went right into uh, electrical sales, like technical sales, uh, and, and, you know, worked in that for like five years. And at some point it was more or less like you know, I was lacking the impact. You know, I, I could have stayed there for the rest of my career, but it just wasn't fulfilling for me anymore. Um, and that's when I met my wife uh, and moved back to New Jersey uh, and, and started pursuing more, you know, I wanted more out of my life and just to leave more of an impact. So that's when, you know, I came across this theological prefab company and we all partnered up, got together and took this to, to the New York city market. Uh, they had an electrical contractor relationship that we were kind of testing this out on. And then after that, we decided let's take this to the market and it exploded. Uh, very quickly in wow. a short period of time. Okay, great. So, and what so else? When you say uh, exploded, talk, talk, talk to me about that. Tell me about what you mean. So, you started off um, trialing it with a particular business, took it to the market. What does that look like? So, the electrical contractor was a high rise electrical contractor. So, they were building high rises in the city. And so, they ran into an issue with labor. Uh, they couldn't find enough people couldn't find enough qualified people and then they couldn't finish their jobs fast enough for the developers to like list the, the, the property for, for rent and, and get it, you know, get their money coming in. So this prefab alternative came, came to mind and just started iterating on it on uh, basically everything, all the assemblies for a given apartment would be completely prefabricated um, to the point where all he had to do is mount, a given assembly right to a stud and it became like an Ikea set for building a high rise uh, in, in an apartment. I love that analogy. Okay. Yeah. And it, yeah. that's like the only way I can describe it because that's, that's really what it became. Um, and so, you know, the, the need for skilled labor on the job site and the need for 
um, the need for the amount of, of labor on the job site was not as high uh, because we were basically doing that in our shop. So it allowed them to then go get more projects. And then as that happened, we started getting better and better at it. We took it to other contractors that were also in that space. And, you know, one project we perform and, and that was it. And that was it. It took off. And so what, what did that growth look like for you as a business? So, I mean, in the beginning, there was you and was there anybody else in the business at that point? Yeah, so I got brought in uh, because, like, the timing of me getting brought in was after. Uh, and then we all kind right. of worked together to bring it to the market. So they had been working on this, but it wasn't really like a full business. Uh, actually, it definitely mm -hmm. wasn't a full business. So there's probably... 10, 10 ish people when I came in. And then yep. two years later, we were at 55 people. We had the 15 offshore drafters uh, and, you know, ready for more. So it was, yeah. it was, it was a lot to handle in a short period of time. And that concept mm -hmm. of hitting the ceiling was very real, uh, both emotionally and. <laughs> And physically, because there's a lot of changes happening in a short period of time. Yeah, I always talk about that, you know, that EOS works for those people who've kind of just been growing kind of naturally, organically and feeling and getting stuck. But most importantly, for those that are growing really fast, where perhaps the wheels are falling off because growth, fast growth sounds fantastic, right? But it's not actually all that easy, is it? it it's with EOS, it becomes way more manageable. Without EOS, I, I I swear we would have completely flopped. I don't think we would have been able to maintain it because we would have been looking out six months. You know, we, we were barely trying to keep afloat, let alone, you know, look out six months to a year. We never would have done that without EOS. Um, mm -hmm. It's just the reality of it. So you're, you're so you're pretty much just fighting fires and kind of trying to keep going um, as opposed to focus on what the long term actually looked like. Exactly. And, and we were, you know, we were bringing in business as quickly as we could. Uh, and, you know, when we have the people there to, the, to bring in and the materials to buy, we had it all ready to go. It was more or less like, hey, bring the customers in. And as that started happening, it became a, well, quality is starting to, to sink. And so we had to adapt to you know, hey, well, why is quality falling down? And, you know, if quality falls down, we may lose the second opportunity for a new customer. So it all tied together. And, you know, I, I think we did a really good job of, uh, you know, moving the needle forward as as fast as it grew. So mm, that's awesome. So how did you how did the company come across the US? Like, what was it that even prompted the the business to think about doing something different because it's very easy to get caught up in that fighting fires day-to-day -day stuff and not look for help and just go I oh, will manage <laughs> yeah so the electrical contractor they they were running on EOS prior so they were running on EOS for years oh. uh, in in Brooklyn so uh, but Svi actually I, I believe he sold his company to the electrical contractor and then he worked himself out of that as well. And then implemented for them. And then, you know, also mm -hmm. implemented for the prefab company. So, you know, the combination, they had familiarity with it. This company wasn't really fully set up yet. Uh, and so, you know, I think one of the rocks was like, Hey, let's bring someone on to like, take this out to the market. Um, and so it was like a perfect, perfect partnership because that it just looked timing was perfect. Yeah. Excellent. And so, you know, in terms of some of the challenges that you were facing, um, can you share some of those with us and tell us how EOS actually helped you with those challenges in the business? The most specific challenge uh, that I can think of is just bringing on, thinking bigger. Uh, one of the, mm. one of the moments, the most pivotal moments that, that, that allowed us to get to that growth was the offshore drafting company. So right off the bat, so basically we're, we're designing these shop drawings for the people in, uh, on the job site for them to read and say, Hey, all right, well, this is how we install this. And this is where we put this, this, and this. Now, in order for us to do that, you know, we need people to draft those drawings. So we originally tried to hire an engineer, you know, on site, 
it's funny, you, you know, you laugh because it, it's almost impossible to find someone in in New Jersey where we were at a, an affordable rate. Uh, so, right. you know, we exhausted that option. But I think what really resonated with the team is that we said, hey, for us to go here in the long term, how are we going to get there? And, you know, we all thought we we're like, well, we can't we're not going to be able to hire 10 engineers. We can't even hire one. So that that immediately was like a mindset shift where in order to get to that goal, we have to do things way differently. And I, can, I think it kind of ties into the uh, the Ben Hardy book of 10x is easier than 2x because we didn't have that option. You know, well, we were going there. There's only like two or three paths to take. And, you know, even, even the drafting company had a hard time keeping up with us. I mean, we brought on 15 of them within like a year and a half. I mean, it was, and you know, they had to go find the people and they had to go train all those people. Um, but that was off our backs, which was huge for us. We got to focus more on the product side um, and then just managing and measuring them to make sure that they were doing, you know, what we needed, what we expected of them. Hmm. I think it's absolutely true. And I love the, I love the um, Ben Hardy and Dan Sullivan book. But um, I'm British, so I've actually changed it from 10x to 10 times. Like, it's like 10 times your thinking. And I think that's what EOS does is it actually it makes you think very, very differently. So rather than being stuck in the weeds and fighting the fires and just working out how you go from day to day, you are very, very focused on that 10-year target and what it looks like. And you know that actually that can't be spreadsheeted, right? It's not something you can kind of go, oh, yes, we can get there by organic growth. You have to completely change the way that you think uh, in the business and so therefore you're still working on the day-to-day -day stuff in terms of measuring the data everybody's got their measurables we're running our level 10 meetings but you're doing it with that end goal in mind of okay this is where we're headed how are we going to get there and you know we could have you're right we could have you know organically grown and we mm -hmm. would have struggled probably just as much you know it w the struggle would have been the same the time that we spent would have been the same but the result would have been wildly different uh, because, you know, we wouldn't have gotten to where we were, where we were without thinking bigger and bigger. So that, that is a prime example of EOS just forcing you to not only EOS, but also someone who's a third party to your business. That is so huge so that they, you know, when you're in it, you don't realize what the things that come out of your mouth where you're like, Oh, <laughs> good point. <laughs> you know, and just simple little things where you, you know, like we, we all lie to ourselves about, you know, how we're doing when, you know, having that third party so that you can say, hey, that's not actually what is true. It, is that a fact? And, you know, that was huge for us, mm. especially me. I yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I know that I have recently discovered that even though I'm an EOS implementer myself, I'm actually having another EOS implementer help me with my business because you, it's really difficult when you're working in it. It's very, very easy to kind of con yourself and tell, everything, and tell you that everything's okay. So an external party, I think, actually um, helps you have those difficult conversations, challenges you to think a wee bit differently. And we don't tell people what to do as an implementer, but we are we're asking those questions that will actually make them go, oh, yes, okay, maybe I, um, yeah, that's not quite the, the truth or it's not quite what I should be looking at. So, yeah, it's an important factor. So do you think there was a, a favorite tool in EOS in, in that business? Because I'm going to talk to you in a moment about the companies you're working with now. But in terms of the, you know, when you're working in that business, was there a favorite tool that in EOS that you went, that just literally changed everything for us? I mean, if it wasn't the meeting pulse, it was the accountability chart for me. I mean, especially, uh, yeah. especially when it gets to, you know, mid-manager level and, and understanding who's really accountable for what and trying to elevate the leadership team to focus on the bigger picture and having the ability mm -hmm. to delegate things down. I, I mean, I think they're all so good. <laughs> like, you know, the scorecard, the oh, meet, yes. <laughs> like, they're all really good. But I would say for us, it was, we constantly revisited the accountability chart uh, and the meeting pulse is really what kept us on track to make sure that every single week, you know, we were talking about the things that need to get talked about that week. Mm. 
So let's just talk a little bit about the accountability chart because those who've not heard of EOS and particularly in this side of the world, there's not a huge awareness of it. So the accountability chart is a, is a, a, a unique kind of EOS tool that talks about rather than organizational, uh, you normally get, what are they called? Um, a structure chart where you've got, you know, the, the, the title and the person who holds that thing. The accountability chart really takes you back to thinking about what are the main functions in your business and what do you need in each of those functions from an accountability perspective. And it talks to structure first, people second. So, but you just made a really interesting point. It's like it actually allows the leadership team to be very, very focused on taking the business forward with the management team actually executing on that. So tell us a little bit about your experience because you would have been introduced the accountability chart at that point, what did your structure look like and did, and did it change after you went through that exercise? I mean, right off the bat, we really only had a leadership team to start and, you know, a few people building parts and assembly. So it wasn't too much. And then as it progressed, I mean, you know, I think in two years, you're, you know, we added from 10 to like 55 people in house plus the 15 mm -hmm. drafters. If we weren't constantly looking at the accountability chart, you know, a lot of people would just show up and not know what their job was or not have any clue who's taking what. And, and most importantly, yeah. you know, uh, our head of operations, he would have completely burned out. Uh, you know, that's where the bulk, that's where the bulk of the work was. Uh, and, and we were in the process of kind of breaking that out because it was a, a very, very detailed role. Uh, so we were like about to break it out into like, operations and then engineering so then we'd have two different people on the leadership team because it got to the point where you know he was just accountable for too much um but yeah i mean the accountability chart to for someone like him you know where you're getting a ton of work thrown at you constantly uh because we had those aggressive goals he he had to adapt quickly and he did a very good job of you know delegating quickly because he almost had no choice. Mm -hmm. So he had to find a way to get the work done without it being on him. And the accountability chart was a really simple way for, for us to all just collectively sit down and think, how can we keep removing things off your plate? And who is able to fill really GWC, the, the roles that, and for all the people out there that aren't familiar with GWC, people that get it, want it, and have the capacity to do it, who, what person or people underneath you can GWC those roles for you? Uh, it was a constant evolution. And like, you know, I'm sure most or some EOS implementers would say it's, you know, it's like wet cement. It's going to change. Uh, it's a constant yeah. evolution. And so that's the, the classic difference between that and an organizational chart. An organizational chart generally kind of gets put out there once, it, it gets almost almost set in stone, doesn't it? And then that's what we're going to do. Whereas the accountability chart, you know, we review it sometimes every three months in a fast growing company, sometimes it's every six months, but we're always looking and saying, hey, do we have the right structure? And it, it gives you a chance to see where you're getting a person who's overwhelmed and then um, you know, delegating down so that person can elevate up to what where they add the most value in the business, doesn't it? I think that's a great point too with uh, being overwhelmed. That ha that happened constantly uh, because at some point, you know, right off the bat, pressure's on on me to bring in new business. So, you know, you call sales, hit the ceiling. You have to bring in more work so that, you know, operations could then work. At some point that shifted uh, and those emotions started showing up in meetings. Those emotions started showing up and just, day-to-day -day conversations and that's when those signs are hitting the ceiling uh and, and you know firsthand experience that where he he was just you know he's like i hit the ceiling and eventually in an annual he raised his hand after a lot of issues kept you know pointing back to operations he was like you know i don't want this role anymore because we did G gwc with each okay. other and he's like i don't want this role anymore we were like, what? Uh, what are we going to do? And he's like, I, I honestly would just prefer to be in that pro senior project manager role. It's what I like to do. It's what I'm really good at. And, you know, we looked at each other and we're like, yeah, you're right. Uh, so wow. what does it look like? How does this move forward? Uh, and so we worked out a plan to, to really get him into that role because that's what he liked to do. He didn't want to lead and manage people. Just wasn't. 
yep. wasn't what he was good at and didn't it's not what he enjoyed. But for him to be able to say mm-hmm. that took a year. I mean, it was a year of EOS at that point where he was like, he finally felt comfortable coming out and saying like, and not being fearful that he would be out of a job. You know, like that's a pretty yeah. scary moment for for most people out there. It is fascinating because well, I've had I've done this through, obviously with a number of companies and as we go through this process, yeah, in the beginning it can be a bit challenging because it's working out, you know, who really is in the leadership team and who isn't. And I've actually had the classic situation where um, we had the converse, we, so we drew up the structure of the business without thinking about people and very, very clear on what each of the roles were accountable for. And then this was a business that's been around for I think about 30 odd years and, and two of the employees have been there for over 20 years. And one was the sales guy and one was the operations guy. And when we actually she wrote up what the job was all about and what the accountabilities were they actually both said um i think i want to do the other role and so the ops guy wanted to do the sales role and the sales guy wanted to do the ops role and so we did the whole gwc went around the room did the you know the live um performance review if you like and made sure that we you know, that these people definitely did gwc the role and they actually ended up switching now you don't normally get that in an organization right because you feel like you you're there you're doing this job you have to stay in that job but the beauty of always doing this accountability chart and always looking at what the company needs, it gives people a chance like your ops guy to go, actually, I don't want to be doing this role anymore. I, I, I like the idea of this one. Or, and that could be up or down. It doesn't really matter. It just means you're actually getting people really working in. I know Dan calls it the ability. I call it the zone of genius. You know, where do they really add the most value to the business and where they're loving what they're doing? It's not. It doesn't even become like work. And, that, and that's like, I think, you know, my generation between what I learned from my, my father and, and where I'm at now, you know, it's just, there's a, mm-hmm. there's a different generational, uh, ideology where, you know, we, my gener and I'm speaking for my generation. So <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, for the most part, it's, it's, I want to be spending my time doing something that I love to do. If I don't love what I do, I'm not going to do a great job at it either. So why not just do the thing that I'd like to do uh, versus I'm going to work really hard, you know, because I have to, you know, that, that I think that paradigm is shifting um, and I love it. And that's why I, you know, I absolutely love EOS because it promotes that and it promotes people, mm-hmm. you know, not, you know, going to Monday morning meetings where they're like, Oh, I absolutely hate my job. You know, like, that's not what life's about. You know, there's so much more to life than that. So that's yeah. why, I, you know, I'll talk about this all night. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, and I completely agree. And I think I mean, because people don't think it's only the business owners that should be loving what they're doing. I, it's got to be everybody in the business. Like er, nobody should actually get up on a Monday morning and go, I don't want to go to work. Like there is a role for everybody in the business. And, you know, if it's not in that company, it'll be another company for you. But there is definitely a role where you will absolutely love what you're doing and want to go to work every day and add huge value. So just by having the opportunity to kind of review that on a regular basis, I think is, is absolutely um, you know, tantamount to what EOS is all about. I also think like, you know, companies and, and specifically business owners who, who really value the relationship of their employees, you know, if that person isn't the person for their company, they're not the right person and maybe they're not in the right seat or vice versa. The business owner that's able to help that person go find a, a, another job or another place where they will be at home or they will be comfortable you know, I, I know a select few business owners that are like that and they have everything that they ever wanted to achieve because of those those valuable and loving relationships. And that's really what it comes down to is just caring for someone else and not just leaving them out. Hey, you're fired. See, like, see you in a week. Like, I'll never see you again. Never talk to you. Like, you can do that. And obviously everyone's different. But those are the business owners who I've seen like, really have the most fulfilling lives and also have people absolutely, you know, run through walls for them because they genuinely care. Yeah. I actually have an old, old business mentor, a business, a boss actually that really um, helped me have a breakthrough in terms of 
moving away from what I thought I had to do because that's what I was trained to do, but even though I didn't enjoy it, to seeing what I actually really loved and questioning me and kind of going, well, why are you continuing to do that when it's not really what you love? And I mean, that changed my entire career path. And I'm hugely grateful to Jeff for, for doing that because he didn't have to, but he could just see that I had potential in a different area. And that was, yeah, it was life changing. I love it. Hmm. Cool. Hey, so now I know that now, so now you, that you've, you've moved on. You're now a, a, a professional EOS implementer. That's what you're doing. Um, and you're working a lot, I know, with family businesses. So tell me a little bit about, about how you now use what you learned and, and, and the EOS tools to help with family businesses. Cause that's another dynamic altogether, isn't it? Yeah. So mostly, and that kind of just happened, you know, a lot of. <laughs> you know, my age group or you're in networking groups or you, you come across people and I just start talking to people and sure enough, it's just, oh yeah, you know, fam I'm in a family business or I'm in a family, like it just kept happening. And I was like, huh. Um, but also on the blue collar side, because that's also what I came from. Uh, but both are, I mean, they're, they're, diff everything's difficult. Um, it's a matter of at least just being open and honest, uh, asking the right questions no sacred cows, you know, everyone is, we are all people in the business and no one's, no one's bigger than that. So it's been very fun, uh, just working through these situations because like, you know, family's family, but then also business is business. So it's like mixing the two is, you know, I'd love to hear your perspective on, on that as well, because it's, you know, it, it comes with its challenges, but at the same time, it's, yeah. you're working with the people that you love. You know, they're your family. So, yeah. I've actually been really interesting. I've, I've been working with a client. Um, they've got about 70 employees, which is a reasonable size for a New Zealand business because our small businesses are much smaller. And uh, so 70 is a, a reasonable size. And they, before they came across the US, they were both working in the business together. Um, and they were always at each other's throats because it turns out one of them was a visionary, one was an integrator. But they didn't have the, the, the labels, the box, the kind of the, the understanding of what that was. And so it was getting really personal. So as a husband and wife team, you know, that their business stuff was actually overflowing into their personal family life because they were getting frustrated with each other and, and the way that they worked together. And so when we started working with the EOS and the company and we suddenly kind of, you know, did the accountability chart and said, hey, there's this role called the visionary and we described a typical visionary, you know, the, the bright shiny object syndrome, build the plane as you jump off the cliff and hope that it's going to all work out. And then we described the integrator being the person who wants to go, now before we take off and fly, we want to make sure the planes are ready to go and they're detail focused. And, rah, rah. and it was funny because they, it, it was like a light bulb went off it's like ah suddenly it became not personal anymore so now the wife who was the integrator could talk about the fact that her husband who was the visionary he's not Stuart being a pain in the ass it's just Stuart being a visionary and that's what visionaries do and he on the converse side could kind of go it's not Lisa just being her you know she's always nagging me and always trying to get me to do all this it's like actually oh, Lisa's just being an integrator and that's what she does and that's what she's good at and so I think that EOS in a family business can help you take away some of that personal stuff. So it becomes about the real business and what's going on in the business um, so that you can enjoy the family life in a different way because the business has got some structure around it. So that's been my experience. I'd, I'd love to hear yours. <laughs> I really like the the framework of the visionary integrator being, it's like a contract between the two of them on value uh, because I feel like a lot of people in the business you know, as a visionary, you're like, without having e prior to EOS, you know, if you're a visionary, you're like, well, you know, all these things happen because of my big ideas. And then if you're the integrator, you're like, I literally do everything here and you don't do anything. So, but they don't know that before EOS is even introduced. So having like, just like you said, having that label for the visionary and having that label for the integrator, it's that, hey, we're, we're equal in terms of value. Mm. We both need each other. And so that kind of like evens the playing field. And so I've, I've noticed that even just talking to people about e what EOS is. And, you know, I had a story the other day where, you know, a guy broke up with his partner uh, in the business. And, you know, after introducing the visionary integrator, uh, you know, scenario, he was like, that's exactly what we had but we didn't have a label for it. You know, it wasn't understood that, Hey, like that's the seat that you were really good at. And this is the seat that I'm really good at, but we, we both need all, like we both need those seats filled. So I, I'm a real big fan of, you know, that 
that discovery because it, it really just clarifies everything for, uh, you know, who really, where the value is split in the organization. Mm. And I think also from a family business perspective, you know, if you've got a multi-generational family business, not just husband and wife, but, you know, husband and wife, and then maybe a son or a daughter. And um, it also, again, that accountability chart can give some real, again, some structure that takes away the personal element and goes, actually, this is what the business really, really needs. In order to function for the next six to 12 months, these are the kind of the main functions. This is what it actually needs. And then working through that GWC, again, it takes it away from being personal. So it's not that you're the aunt or the daughter or the son, but actually, this is what the business needs. Do we have the right person to actually fill that seat? And if you're not the right person for that seat, it's okay. There'll be another seat that you may or may not be right for. So I don't know. I just, I, I always find that it is, it works beautifully well in every business, but in family business particularly, it can just really help to alleviate a lot of that emotional or personal stuff in the business. One specific challenge that, uh, that I've seen right now is, you know, family business, Dad's still in the business, uh, in the sales seat, but the son and his wife have taken over as visionary integrator. Accountability has been difficult and also, uh, kind of leaking into other seats has been difficult. So there's not a clear, yeah. like, Hey, like, I mean, it is clear, but we're working on that issue of you don't have to do everything anymore. Uh, and that's, you know, it's, that's a very new concept for, for the father. So, you know, totally understand, you know, after you built a business for 30 plus years, you know, it's hard to just like turn it off. You know, it's like a, it's like a baby. You're, you're just handing over your baby, but you're like, I want to make sure it's okay. So, <laughs> you know, that's definitely been a challenge of like, Hey, you, you don't have to do it all now. You know, we have, this is a system now we have a process. We have people in specific seats that are going to help execute that. And, you know, we're going to need you to trust them. So that that's definitely been a, a challenge. Uh, definitely interested to hear more, you know, if you've experienced something similar to that. Yeah, I mean, I've got a couple of businesses I'm working at the moment. I'm smiling to myself because the same sort of thing. Um, it is it is very difficult for the original founder to necessarily let go. But if you've got a, a really clearly defined structure and clearly defined accountabilities, then um, it is easier to see that uh, the team – well, when you start – putting in the structure, but then also the level 10 meetings. I think it's one of the most key key things is actually getting together on a weekly basis and having those discussions as a team. And then, you know, pushing things up or down the accountability chart, depending on where they naturally belong. So it isn't, a, I mean, I think people think, oh, if you're having a leadership team meeting and we're all discussing all these things together, is it decision by committee? No, it's not. But it's actually, you know, we, we trust you fully to get on with your accountability according to the accountability chart. But if you can't deal with that issue and you need to bring it up, we will help you, the whole, the whole leadership team. And I I think that gives the founder some sense of, ah, okay, now we have the system and the process and you can see the capability of the people and go, okay, um, I might be more inclined to let go because I know this is actually working. Yeah. But it's, it's still, it still takes time. If I'm honest, it still takes time. <laughs> yeah. It, I think it's just great to introduce the concept and, you know, as the team grows and it, like every team's different, you know, some teams are like, Hey, right away we're, we're done. Or, you know, yeah. they'll be a little bit more patient, totally dependent on the team. You know, I may want it for them, but, you know, not I can't want it more than they do. That's exactly right. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Hey, um, I always ask all of our guests, you know, what their three top tips or tools are. And I'm sure that with both your experience of being an EOS implementer, but also having run it in your business, what would you say your, your top three tips or tools are? They don't have to be EOS related, but yeah, just something you could share with the listeners. They could actually go away and do something sort of tangible with it. So I actually had this thought today and I'm glad you asked this because uh, I just had this thought in the car today where oh, yeah. if if you're thinking about making some sort of investment in your business and whether it's learning, training, whatever, make sure it's something that will make you take action. I, I can't tell you. And for me personally, you know, I've purchased, you know, courses and all these different types of things and like do it yourself and you buy it and then you don't follow through with it. And, you know, that's what EOS really, you know, I had to show up at the quarterly and I had to have my rocks done and I was going to look at Svi mm. and make sure, and he was going to look at me and 
that that human energy element is so powerful that I finally realized it just hit me today where I was like, when you invest in your business, whether it's a person that's going to make you take action or, you know, a thing, whatever it is that makes you take action, invest in that. Mm -hmm. So that would be number yeah. one. Um, and I'm giggling to myself because I've actually got a folder of all the different courses and the coursework that I've bought that I've never actually got around to doing. So I do understand. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, I've done it. We, I think we've all done it. You know, we're all like, oh, yeah, that's yeah. me. Like, I can do that. And we never follow through with it. Um, I would love to yeah. know the stats on what percentage of people actually follow through with all these courses. Um, but anyway. I suspect it's quite low. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And like something that's not only going to force you to take action, but it's going to hold you accountable throughout the process. And that's what I think EOS is like. The genius behind it is that, you know, obviously every tool is so powerful, but that is really, you know, anybody can go implement EOS and get what they want out of their business. But what really makes sure that you get what you want from your business is that someone's there holding your hand with you and on the journey with you and really helping you take action. So that's number one for me. And two more, I don't know. <laughs> don't overanalyze things. I'm an eight out of 10 fact finder. So don't do that. Oh, are you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Don't do that. I, I think my husband might be joining you in that sort of category as well. Yeah. So don't overanalyze. Keep things, keep things simple. Just, yeah. Just go. You'll figure it out. Uh, and the last yeah. one is surround yourself with people that, that you want to grow up with and that you want to continue to grow with. Um, between the all all three of those, I mean, yeah. just make sure action's part of it, and you'll figure it out. <laughs> we always say, don't we? As always, sometimes you need three things to kind of really have a successful business, successful life, and you, you know you need a coach, you need a, a system, and you need a peer community. Um, and so, you know pick a system. We hope it's EOS, get yourself a coach or accountability coach. We hope that's an implementer. And then, you know, have a peer group that will actually keep you motivated. And I think if you've got those three things, you're going to build a much, much better business, which of course leads to a better life. I'm really curious, um, your father, obviously working all those hours when he was in business, is he enjoying retirement? Is he actually making the most of the time that he has free? So, so my no, he, uh, he's still working to this day. Uh, and so he, he's, oh, is know, he? he's, yeah. So, you know, I, we didn't grow up with much, so he's still driving a truck. My goal in the next two years here is I, I want them to just not have to, to be concerned about money. They sacrificed everything for me mm -hmm. and that goes for, you know, their personal lives, uh, friends, relationships, hobbies. They really gave it up for me and my sister. Uh, just to make sure we had a, wow. a better life. So, you know, that, that really is my goal in the next two years to make sure that they don't have to think about money anymore uh, and just enjoy the rest of their lives. Mm, love it. Okay, great. I'm, I'm sure you'll get there. So tell me, um, you obviously are now at a professional EOS implementer, which means, you know, we have gone through the training. You you attend quarterly QCEs to make sure you're mastering your tools all the time. You're completely passionate about what you're doing. If What, what sort of people do you enjoy working with? What's your ideal client from that EOS implementation point of view? I mean, it's typically the, you know, the open-minded, growth-oriented. I don't think it's I don't think it's possible to be successful with EOS without those two things. Uh, the third and what I'm finding myself uh, surrounding myself with is that blue collar business owner who, who really never thought it was possible to have a multi-million dollar business. You know, they're at that verge where they're like, either I get rid of all my people and go just do high profit work or I lean into this and figure it out. Those are my people. Uh, there's tons of people out there who, you know, who, who just went backwards because it was just easier uh, rather than having something like EOS and really a how to work with those people and, and grow the business. Uh, th those are yeah. those are 100 percent my people. And just breaking that Excellent. that mindset of, you know, oh, I, I can't do it. I love that. Yeah, and that's that whole 10x or 10 times, as I call it, to say that I really do truly believe that EOS will get you thinking in a very, very different way. Um, and, and the sooner you start the process, the better as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> 100%. Great. So, right, if anybody wants to get in contact with you, what is the best way to get in contact with you? Yeah, I'm on social media uh, or obviously my email address. 
EOS website. Uh, so yep. any of those and more than happy to help anyone out there who, who's just looking for more in their, in their lives and obviously in their business as well. Oh, thank you. Uh, we'll make sure that those details are in the bottom of the podcast notes. Um, Ryan, thank you so much for your time, particularly on a Friday evening. Really, really appreciate you. you've been very generous with your, your sharing of your knowledge and, and your time. So thank you. I'm happy to be here. Happy to talk about EOS on a Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's time for you to go and join your wife and your family now, but thank you so much for your time and, and we'll catch up again soon. Awesome. Thanks so much, Deborah. Thank you. All Thanks. Right, bye. Thanks for listening to the podcast show, Better Business, Better Life. My name is Deborah Chantry-Taylor. I'm an EOS implementer, family business advisor, business and leadership coach, podcaster, and speaker. However, I'm also a business owner with several current business interests. I'm fortunate to have lived the high life with all the lifestyle, the toys, you name it, and then I've lost it all, not only once, but twice in two spectacular train wrecks. I know what it's like to experience the highs and lows. I came across EOS when they launched into New Zealand using my Entrepreneur's Playground and Event Centre in Parnell, Auckland. I love the simplicity of the tools and their philosophies fitted my personal brand statement perfectly. The brilliance is in the simplicity. I've always been passionate about seeing entrepreneurs lead a life they love, and now I help them live that EOS life. Doing what they love, with people they love, making a huge difference in the world, being compensated appropriately, and with time to pursue other passions. If you want more information or want to get in contact about using EOS in your business, you can visit my website at debra.coach. That's www.debra.coach. Thanks for listening.